Welcome back to my channel, and as always, thanks to my subscribers. Today, I'm building a flat car kit from Red Caboose. This kit is a slight upgrade from the traditional Shake the Box kit, but is still quite a simple build. The Red Caboose line was bought by Intermountain some years ago, but you can still find these kits for sale on eBay and at some dealers. Opening the box, we see that the kit includes a small bag of parts, including trucks, couplers, brake detail, and so forth. The car body, wrapped in protective paper, a sprue with a two-piece underframe attached, instructions, and a steel weight taped to the box. Unwrapping the car body, we see that this kit has been painted and numbered for the Denver and Rio Grande Western Railroad, car number 21047. We can also see that the body has been cast without the center section of the deck. I presume this is to make the body less likely to warp during the casting process. The first step in the assembly is to attach the missing section of the deck. I use sprue cutters to remove the center sprue. Then I use sanding sticks to smooth the opening. Next, I test fit the deck section. It's a little too wide, so I'll file it down until it fits. Notice that I'm applying glue to the inside of the model. I don't want the glue film to show on the finished portions of the model. With the deck complete, it's time to add the stake pockets. The instructions recommend using a number 75 drill to remove any paint film from the insides of all the mounting holes. Notice that the kit includes extra stake pockets. The model requires 24, but the kit includes 26 which means you can lose or damage two and still finish the kit. This is particularly important when you're assembling a kit that is no longer produced. After a few false starts, I learned the best way to attach the stake pockets. Holding the car body in my left hand, I pick up the stake pocket with tweezers and place it in the mounting holes. Then I hold the pocket in place with my left thumb while applying glue on the inside of the model with my right hand. I learned to be generous with the glue. The glue needs to flow through the mounting holes and spread into the joint between the car body and the stake pocket by capillary action. With the stake pockets installed, I clean the rust from the weight and spray one side of the weight flat black. I use Crafter's Pick Ultimate Glue to attach metal to plastic. This is a water-based contact cement. Apply a thin film of glue to both surfaces to be joined and allow it to dry completely clear. Once the glue is clear, you can position the weight and drop it in place. Be careful, you only get one shot. I had scored lines on the underside of the car to show where the weight needed to be for the underframe to fit in position. Once I had the weight in place, I clamped it and allowed the glue to fully cure. The next step is to assemble the underframe. The underframe comes in two pieces, just fit the two pieces together and glue. This kit comes with KC style brakes. See the video description below for a short history of how the K brakes were replaced with AB brakes. Since I modeled the Rio Grande in the late 1950s, I need to replace the supplied KC brakes with an AB brake system, consisting of an air reservoir, an AB valve, and a brake cylinder as shown here. The AB components shown here are from the Actuarial Boxcar Detail Sprues, part number 159. I need to add two pieces of 30,000 styrene between the cross ribs to provide support for the air reservoir and the AB valve. I simply cut a piece of styrene to size, drill a mounting hole, then drop it into place between the cross ribs and glue it in place. Then I repeat with the other support. Remember that the air reservoir and the AB valve are on opposite sides of the car, and they are positioned between the brake cylinder and the A end of the car. The brake cylinder and the AB valve are on the same side of the car as the brake wheel. Here is the completed underframe, with the B end at the left side of the picture. Before I paint it, I test fit, making sure that the B end of the underframe is located at the B end of the car, and I make sure everything fits. At this stage of assembly, the B end of the car is not obvious, but it's the end with two holes drilled for mounting the brake staff. Once the underframe is in place, I notice something I don't like about the kit. The top of the underframe has a small boss at the center of each bolster, 
but the bolsters do not provide continuous contact across the body of the floor. This could lead to a wobbly car, so I decided to glue shims on the top side of all four bolster wings. I glued two strips of styrene together to make a total thickness of 51 thousandths of an inch. This will make the top of the bolster wings flush with the top of the boss in the center of the bolster. I cut four pieces to length and glue them to the bolsters. When all the pieces have been glued in place, I apply some weight while the glue cures, about 30 minutes. Then I spray the underframe flat black. Next, I paint the components a rust color. I'm using Burnt Sienna Craft Paint. Before I can weather the car body, I need to address an anachronism, which I've actually made worse. Note that the model as sold displays a shop date of new 4-25, just above the word Rio, meaning the car has not had any shop modifications since it was built in April 1925. The first anachronism is the use of the flying Rio Grande Herald, which was not adopted until just before World War II, long after April 1925. The second anachronism, which I caused, is that the car is now equipped with AB brakes, which weren't invented until 1933. To address these, I need to show a shop date sometime between 1933 and about 1950, since I modeled the late 1950s era. I found a set of Champ decals, which give me a Burnham Yard service date of 446 and a build date of 210. My research indicated that flat car 21047 was built in November 1909, and that's close enough for me. You may or may not care to go into this much detail to research the prototypes of the models you build, and that's fine either way. I enjoy the research, and my OCD is just bad enough that I am pleased when I can fix anachronisms such as these. In order to make these changes, I need to paint over the new 425 data, spray the car body with a clear gloss varnish, then apply the new decals, and finally spray the car with doll coat. I did not video this process because you have seen it before in my video on breathing new life into old freight cars. Here is the car with the changed decals after a coat of doll coat. Normally, I wait to weather my cars until they are complete, but I chose a different strategy on this car for two reasons. First, I knew that adding the grab irons and stirrup steps would make the car very delicate to handle. And second, I wanted to add a weathered wood deck to the car, and this could be done only after weathering the car body. For this car, I wanted to make the black less black and the white lettering less white. A simple wash of medium gray should be sufficient. I used a craft paint and mixed a very thin wash. Notice I'm just using the water I used to clean my brushes. Any extra color I get from the water will be a bonus. Don't be alarmed if the wash looks too heavy. It will fade considerably as it dries. After the first coat, I can see an improvement, but a second coat is still necessary. The wash will accumulate on the bottom edges of the model. To prevent this, you can brace it so the painted surface is horizontal, as shown here. And here is the car after the second coat. The original black is now a faded gray, and the white lettering no longer looks brand new. This is a simple weathering technique. You should give it a try. Consider other colors as well. Raw umber would look good on many cars. Next, I dry brushed a little burnt umber at the edges and bottoms of the car body to simulate old rust. You could use raw umber just as well. Use a very light hand when you're applying accent colors like this. The human eye can detect very subtle color shades, and it's easy to overdo it. If I were modeling this same car for the 1990s, I would use a lot more rust color. After you're satisfied with the burnt umber, apply a few highlights using burnt sienna to simulate newer rust deposits. Again, a light touch is important. It's a lot easier to add more paint than it is to remove paint. If you make a mistake and apply too much color, Quickly grab a cotton swab and wipe off as much excess paint as possible. I'm using acrylic paints, and you have to be quick. Most flat cars have their stake pockets inset into the edge of the deck, as you can see in this Proto 2000 flat car deck. 
Contrast this with the red caboose model, which has stake pockets mounted on the car sides, making the edges of the deck straight. This gives me the chance to try something I've had in mind for some time. I'm going to add a wood deck using scale 1x6 lumber. I buy my scale lumber from Northeastern Scale Lumber. If you buy the 1x6 in 11 inch plastic packages, it will cost about 37 cents per foot. If you buy it in 24 inch lengths, you'll pay about 22 cents per foot. You'll need about 780 scale feet, or about 9 actual feet, for this project. There are two methods to stain strip wood, and they are both messy. The first method is to gather the wood in a bundle and dunk it into the stain. Then turn the bundle around and dunk the other end. Unfortunately, you're left with a strip wood, which is stained at both ends and raw in the middle. At that point, you're forced into the second method, applying the stain with a brush. I lay my strip wood on a sheet of parchment paper. Do not use wax paper. The silicone coated parchment paper is impervious to alcohol-based stains, keeping the stain off your work surface. I am staining my wood twice using my favorite color combination. Vitero Shadow Gray and Vitero Murky Brown. When the wood is dry, it's time to cut it into uniform lengths. This car deck is 9 feet 6 inches wide, so I need to cut about 80 pieces to that length. This requires a special tool, the chopper by Northwest Shortline. Micromark makes a similar tool called the Chop It. You'll spend about $40 for either tool, and it will be one of the best investments you'll ever make. This is my chopper. As you can see, I have cut a non-slip rubber pad into quarters and glued the quarters to the corners on the underside of the chopper base. This keeps it from sliding around while I use it. I cut one piece of wood 9 feet 6 inches long, then check it against the deck. It's slightly longer than the deck is wide, and that's a good thing. I'd rather have the wood hang over the edge than not quite cover the entire deck. Using that piece as a master, I set the cutting fence on the chopper, and I start cutting. It takes just a few minutes to cut the entire batch of wood. I'm using transfer tape to secure the wood deck to the plastic deck. I cut a length of 1 inch wide transfer tape long enough to cover the entire length of the deck, then trim off the excess with a razor blade. Once the transfer tape has been pressed firmly onto the plastic deck, I peel away the tape leaving behind just a thin film of adhesive. This is much more even than trying to spread glue, and the transfer adhesive will not dry while I'm applying the wood. Now it's just a matter of applying individual wood strips one at a time, making sure to keep them straight and to keep each new piece snug against the previous piece. You do not have to apply a wood deck. There are several good YouTube videos showing how to paint a plastic flat car deck to resemble wood. I have put links to two of the better ones in the description below this video. With the deck complete, it's time to install the grab irons and stirrup steps. These are cast styrene and they are very thin and very fragile. I will have to take care handling the car from this point on. Red Caboose provided 10 grab irons in the kit, but only 8 are required. I cut them free using tweezer style sprue cutters. It's a simple matter to insert them into the pre-drilled holes and cement them in place. Once the cement is cured, I can carefully file off any burrs on the grab irons. Next are the stirrup steps. Here again, Red Caboose has provided extras. I will store the extra stake pockets, grab irons, and stirrup steps in the car box in case I need to replace one of these parts later. I carefully file any burrs off of the stirrup steps, just as I did with the grab irons. The last parts to be installed are the brake staff and the brake wheel. With all parts installed and glue fully cured, I give the entire car body a coat of dull coat. Now I am ready for final touch-up painting. I brush a little grimy black on the hand grabs, the stirrup steps, and the brake staff and brake wheel. This is just a quick way to make these parts blend in with the weathered car body. You can use any dark gray. You're just trying to get rid of the pure black color. Finally, I brush on some rust highlights. Now it's time for final underframe assembly. First remove the coupler gearbox covers from the sprue. 
Be sure to save the plastic sprue. Just toss it in your scrap plastic bin. These discarded sprues can be made to serve a wide variety of purposes. File any burrs off the gearbox cover. Put the coupler in the gearbox and snap the cover in place. I'm using number 5 couplers because the instructions say the gearbox was designed to accept KD number 5 couplers. As you can see, the fit is perfect. The kit comes with self-tapping truck mounting screws. I decided not to use them because they are just a little bit longer than a standard 256 by 316 inch screw. And I was concerned that the longer screw might poke through the deck and force the strip wood away from the adhesive. Instead, I used my 256 tap to tap the holes for truck screws. That makes it easy to mount the trucks. With the truck mounting holes tapped, I glued the underframe in place and mounted the trucks. Notice that I am supporting the flat car on the open box with the deck face down. This protects the brake staff and wheel and makes sure that the car is not resting on the stirrup steps. A quick check of coupler height and the car is ready for service. Before I put the car in service, I make some additions to the box which make it better for storing the car. I add a thin layer of foam and some blocks of foam which will brace the car in position so it doesn't rattle around in the box. Last, I add a self-adhesive label to the box end so I can quickly find any car I'm looking for. I hope I've demonstrated in this video how even a simple kit assembly offers challenges and opportunities to improve the quality of your finished models. I have included links to all the products mentioned in the video in the comments below. As always, I would love to hear your comments and questions. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.